Rachel Rabikoff, and this week we are in the kitchen at Roselle Court in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. We're going to prepare a signature dish of lamb made two ways. Before we begin doing that, we're going to be talking to Mark Zimmerman, who is the Director of Administration here at the museum. Mark, first of all, thank you for inviting us into your beautiful museum again. Thank you for being here. Okay. So, the Nelson Museum, a Kansas City treasure, Roselle Court, a dining experience inside the museum. This wasn't always a restaurant. Was this a, a courtyard? This was an open air courtyard until the roof went on in the 80s, okay. and uh, it's been a restaurant ever since. So, let's talk about the concept for the restaurant. I mean, in a mighty environment. The restaurant serves all of our visitors. It serves them for lunch, it serves them for dinner, and it serves them for many, many special events, which we can celebrate very quickly. In a very big way. So the museum has exhibits from all around the world, throughout time, by some of the greatest artists ever. And how is the food matched to the artwork? Or is it? You know, it's, it's more inspired. It's more inspired. opportunity than it is um, directly related. Um, the, when we do special events like our Chinese New Year celebration, which we've done for many years, uh, this year we just inaugurated our very first Day of the Dead, either, either Dia de los Muertes. Muertes. You said that very Dia well. Dia de los Muertes. Yes. Um, so we did, we played the Mexican food in here. Yeah. We had Indian subcontinent celebrations. We've had American Indian celebrations. Mm -hmm. And so when we have those uh, concentrated activities on weekends or certain days or for a short period of time, we adjust the food and manage the food to, to uh, play with those activities. So there is really a connection between the food and the visual experience we're going to have when we come here, depending upon the event. So Friday nights is a wonderful dinner. It's seated and mm -hmm. plated mm -hmm. for you. And the menu changes. Can we go to the website to know what we're having for dinner Friday night? Every single week. Every single week we know what we're going to have for dinner on Friday night. And this space, just walking in here, you began your entertainment. I mean, mm -hmm. it just being in the space, is this an Italian courtyard? Did I hear mm -hmm. it was Italian? It's Italian. It, it, it plays to the theme. I remember when I first moved to Kansas City 10 years ago and I walked in this space and been to Italy for the first time a couple of years earlier, and I was shocked <laughs> to walk in and say, who knew? Who knew that this existed? Um, and it's a restaurant, and it's a place you can walk in any time you choose. Um, and you can I come think for lunch, you can come for cocktails, you can come for dessert, come for dessert and coffee. You can uh, come you can, for scones. You can come for scones. <laughs> we have a few signature items that we've had you do. for a long, long okay, time. Okay, I'm going to tell you, I've been to England. Mm -hmm. I've been to Ireland, and their scones aren't any better than what you have right here in Kansas City for South Florida. I don't want to suggest that you have to have an art experience to choose to dine in this restaurant. And, and yet, if you come to this restaurant, you will have an art experience. I wanted to share with you also on Thursday nights, and we don't run the restaurant, but we have happy hour in the lobby. Um, the lobby comes alive with the bar, with food and small plates, and we set up tables, and we play music, and it's become a happening place on Thursday nights from 5.30 to 8.30. So get your ready for the weekend on Thursday. Well, well, that's great. I think the small plates are so much fun for a variety of reasons. Instead of getting a big plate of food for a dish, you get several tastes. I think it also invites people to share. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so that's a nice interaction over food. And so in the in the main lobby, Black lobby. Mm -hmm. the block lobby mm -hmm. going up, Nice. And with the Rodin exhibit of present, you're, you're surrounded by art, mm -hmm. surrounded by ambiance. The food and tastes better that way. Food tastes better, and your, the enjoyment is really people in the room. And, and I think it also invites that interaction more than it would in a typical restaurant setting because it just mm -hmm. invites that kind of movement. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for the care you're taking to manage this wonderful museum and restaurant. And we appreciate being invited back. Please come back anytime. We continue our chat with the chef with a chat with the
the chef, executive chef Dwight Hawkins here at Roselle Court at the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art. Thank you for inviting us once again into your kitchen. So, we've been in your kitchen before, but we're thrilled to be back again. Refresh us a little bit. What was your journey here? Well, you know, I started up through the ranks with uh, Long John Silvers. And that's like when I was 19. Yeah, oh my goodness. And I worked my way up through the ranks. And so I really learned the business inside and out. And then uh, took a break from that and uh, decided if I was going to get into this, if I was going to continue cooking, I wanted to do it professionally. I wanted to kind of get out of the fast food side of it. Good for you. I went to Johnson County Community College. So many of our chefs have been through that program and really a culinary school that we can be proud of in Kansas. Oh, absolutely. It's, absolutely. A, it's a great program. Great, it's a great program. program. Started my apprenticeship at the Adams Park mm -hmm. Hotel. And uh, then I went to, I, I worked, the, worked my way up the ranks there, banquet chef, sous chef, executive sous chef, and then I felt that I needed to go outside of that hotel to yes. find my own my own home. Yes. So uh, I was I went to the Radisson Hotel down, downtown, mm -hmm. which is now the Phillips House. Yes. Um, that was my first executive chef job. She gave me a tour of Monet and Pissarro and there Picasso you and you we, hooked? then we walked into this room. Yes. And I thought, you know, I could probably I could do this. probably make this my home. So speaking of the art, and that this is housed in a world-class museum, um, how has that affected your cooking here, your, your chefdom here? Well, it kind of had some creative freedom, which was very nice. So any time that we were doing um, an exhibition from like a foreign country or from a different culture, you know, if we were doing ancient Egypt, we actually, I did uh, research, you know, Cairo.com to find out what they're actually doing and mm -hmm. doing there now. Mm -hmm. How much of the street food has actually stayed, you know, and they actually fixed in the restaurants, supposed to just on the streets, have been refined, you know, and you know, kind of what's going on. What's fun, though. Oh, so yes. it's, it's a lot of fun. And, you know, then when, when we had uh, an exhibition from the Congo, it was a little harder to find information Could from be, what's yeah. going on. <laughs> in the jungle in Africa. There you go. But there's still information out there, and that's yes. the beauty of the web. That it is gratifying to know that the Nelson is bringing the food in to help expand the experience of the visual arts. That is wonderful. So, executive shop, that means you provide leadership in the kitchen. You already know the business end. You've been formally trained. But what is it you want to impart to your cooks? Because at one time, that was your experience coming up in this profession. Well, it's a it's a very brittle industry. It's very hard. I mean, there's you know, and if you look at the statistics, only 85 percent, or I should say, 85 percent of restaurants fail within the first two years. Mm -hmm. So you really have to know the business, and you need hire you hire people that are hungry and really want to learn. But also, they have to realize that they're going to have to work weekends, holidays. I think it's physically challenging. It's you are on your feet. It is hot. You are lifting heavy pots and pans. So the commitment needs to be there to to physically endure it. Absolutely. Because, you're, I mean, because you could be on your, your, your feet 15 hours for several days in a row. It just depends on what's going on. So what's your inspiration? What keeps you inspired every day under all these physical conditions? Um, you know, I, I just, I love to cook. I, it's, it's, my, it's, my, it's my passion. It's what I like to do. I like to see um, the appreciativeness of the, the people that we entertain. That's what um, it's about, isn't it? It's about pleasing them. It is. And it's art on a plate. I mean, I, I feel really good about the food that yeah. we produce. Yep. And um, you know, I like to present it very artfully, try to, you know, try to stay uh, true to the cultures. Um, and I don't, I don't personally do a whole lot of fusion because I kind of feel that's confusion. Okay. And, uh, no, sure. okay. and so I, you know, I try to stay for you know, an Asian thing. We're trying to use a lot of Asian ingredients. I try not to mix it up too much with the cultures because uh, you know, I, just, I, I just like to stay true to the culture. It, it sometimes is confusing. I don't want to taste something and say, what was that? And so by keeping it pure the way you're doing it, we won't have that happen here. Well, not so much that we're, you're not going to see a whole lot of it. A lot of foams and you know, but well, what I won't have, I, mean, I make up with textures and on color, and you know, it's still 
good food presented and prepared well. And I think that's the secret. I mean, I think I, I think this is more of a kind of a bistro kind of mm -hmm. thing where you know we're just doing doing simple food, but we're trying to do it right. Near and dear to my heart. Okay, so what are we going to make today in the kitchen, Chef? We're going to do lamb two ways. Oh, okay. We're going to do a grilled lamb chop. Oh, always a winner. Marinate, marinate a little garlic and red wine and rosemary. And we're going to do braised lamb asabuco, which is basically a little center cut uh, lamb shank. Um, we're going to sear it off and we're going to cook it real slow in some, some broth and aromatics. And that cooks in the oven for two and a half, three hours until it just falls off the bone. Vegetable mash, which involves sweet potatoes, parsnips, and green beans. And we'll some orange beans on the side. And we've got some uh, cherry, kind of a sun dried cherry, timmy glaze to go over the whole uh, over the just, lamb. It's going to have, it's going to have all of it. Now you do know that our um, celebrity taster is the very CEO of the museum, so I, I know you're up to the task. I, I, I am. Okay. Enjoy it. I know you do. <laughs> okay, I think you and I should go into the kitchen. Yes, and I think you should come with us. I'm Connie Rabakoff, and this week we are in the kitchen at Roselle Court in the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art with their executive chef Dwight Hawkins. Dwight, thank you for inviting us once again. Okay, what are we making, Chef? We're going to make lamb two ways. We're going to okay. make lamb, we're going to do a grilled lamb chop. We're going to do a uh, braised lamb asabuco. It's just a little bitty, little, little shake. We're going to do a seasonal root vegetable mash and some green beans and a sun dried cherry sauce to go over the top of it. Um, yum. Okay, where do we start? All right, we're going to start with uh, we've got some carrots. Now, I've got, you're going to have, you'll have the recipe so you don't have to worry about the, the, the measurement of the ingredients. Uh, so of course. So this is going to be up on the website and on our recipe segment. Okay. okay. Then I've got, uh, this? this is rutabagas. Okay. In other words, a yellow turnip. A lot of people aren't really familiar with this, but it looks like a big, it looks like a yellow turnip. It usually has a lot of paraffin wax on the outside yes. because it deteriorates really rapidly after it's pulled out of the ground. And so just peel that off. You just peel, you just peel that off. Okay. It's, you, you don't want to eat the paraffin. It's don't like a hurt you, but it's paraffin. food, food grade. Mm -hmm. so we're going to put that. In. This is just boiling water. I just okay, got the water. No salt in it. I'm going to salt it. You will salt it. I'm going to salt it. Okay. A little bit of uh, kosher salt. Just kosher salt. And, and these then? are parsnips. Mm -hmm. These are kind of a, you know, it's the white carrots that you see it's in the like store. A white but it's kind of got a, uh, eh, it's kind Earth of horsey, yeah. horseradishy, but not no. hot. You know, it's kind it's of like, kind of like it's kind of like that. It's really an underutilized vegetable in, in the United States. It's really it's really popular in Europe. We've kind of forgot about it. You know, people really don't know what parsnips are. But when you put them in a mash like this, it's really it's a really earthy. It's really nice change from just regular mashed potatoes. That's a wonderful fall winter dish. Okay, so we're just going to let that go. It's going to take about 15 minutes. So we just want to be able to take a, a fork or a knife and just kind of poke through it without much resistance. Um, these will be better if they're a little on the not, you know, like not mushy side. You know, you want them just done. You want them all, you know, just all dente. We're gonna get our sun-dried, sun-dried cherry sauce going. That's just now that's dry cherries. Dry cherries, dry and I cherries. actually threw some dry cranberries in there. A lot of times, oh. if I, it just depends on what I can find in the store. I mean, it can be raspberries, blueberries, anything. You know, all those all those berries really uh -huh. go well with lamb. But you can make, I, I do different variations, but I make, I prepare it the same way. This I just okay. add some cranberries and some dried cherries. Okay. And then fruit really goes well with onion. And we forget that. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we especially in a savory, in a savory sauce, it goes really well with onion. The swings in that, oh, it smells so good. And then All we've right, got, so onions and dried cherries and gran cranberries. And just a little bit of granulated, granulated onion powder. Now, you know, we, I've talked about this before, you know, the, the powdered, powdered onion. Versus granulated. Totally, totally different, mm -hmm. but they complement each other very well. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, it's, it's not a sin, in my opinion, to put both in the recipe because one adds kind of a little bit more vitality than just a straight onion. It does, but uh, a reminder not to use onion powder because you're going to get a different result. And sometimes those powders really get cake. bitter. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah, this is granulated. It's a granulated, right. a, a distinction worth noting. It is, because you'll just have little hard cake yeah, balls will. of onion. We're powder. not going to do that. 
Now what's this? This is apple juice. We're just gonna put just some, plain apple juice. Just plain old apple juice. And then we're gonna put some sugar. Because we want that sugar, the sugar's gonna dissolve because and it's gonna remember that cranberries in particular are very tart. Very tart. Very tart. Very tart. Okay. So we're gonna try to offset some of that tart. But we're, then we're gonna turn around and add some vinegar because we don't want it to be too over the top on the sugar side. You know, I'm trying to hit everything. I'm trying to hit sweet, salt, you know, sour, and bitter. I'm trying to catch all of those in, in this little simple sauce. So this is just white vinegar. It's gonna just a little bit of salt now, so and then we'll adjust, we'll adjust the salt and pepper. Okay. We're just gonna bring that to a boil, you know, and then we're just gonna reduce it to a simmer. And we're just gonna let all those berries reconstitute, swell back up. And then meanwhile, the, 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 everything's gonna be cooking down. It's gonna make a nice little syrup. It's gonna make it. It's gonna basically make its own sauce. So we're gonna reduce it to a syrup. Syrup. Kind of, syrup okay. This is, okay. So we got the dried cherry, sun-dried cherry sauce going. We got the root vegetables going. Now what next, Chef? Okay. Now we need to make a marinade for our grilled lamb. Okay. Okay. Now this is probably gonna. This, this, this is gonna make quite a bit, but okay. we can hope you can scale it down on the recipes. Okay. Okay. This is balsamic vinegar. Mm. This is olive oil. Is that extra virgin? It looks it's like. just pomace. It's, it's, okay. uh, I didn't spend the I didn't spend all the money on the extra virgin because we're just putting with, you know, it's going to be a bunch of big flavors. So many other I'm not, flavors. Yeah, I'm not now, really what do we have here? This is just uh, uh, diced or uh, chopped rosemary. Chopped rosemary, Fresh which rosemary. is a traditional seasoning for lamb. It is. Yes. Very much. And garlic. Ah, uh, as is well. garlic. And you rough chop that. I can rough, tell. Yeah, rough, rough, rough. Doesn't need to be tiny, tiny pieces. Okay. Okay, then we have a little bit of lemon juice. Uh, don't forget that lemon juice. Sometimes right. I forget that. We don't do that. No, no, no. Oh, and some red wine. Yeah. And a dry, would you say? A dry wine. Okay. Something that you would, you know, something you would drink with your lamb would and probably please, be the best, and, best choice. And please remember that, that any wine you use in cooking would be wine that you would be drinking. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. Don't, don't use the cooking wine from the stores. Oh, yeah, we wouldn't think of doing that. Like too much sodium in them anyway. Right. Okay. And then we're going to put just a little bit of black pepper in here. Okay. And I'm gonna kind of leave the salt out. I'm gonna do that toward when we when we take it out and we actually okay. actually grill it on the grill. So now here's kinda, our little guy, and it's been French, which been means the out, meat right. has been removed from the bone. And, you know, and, and your butcher can do that. Butcher usually will do that. Okay. For you. Is this something you could do the night before, or maybe yeah, absolutely. Not? Okay. I mean, yeah, I would like to. I like to keep it in there at least three or four hours, but overnight it tastes. Flavor is really, really good the next day. So the lamb chops are marinating, right. and now for the lamb shank portion. Right. These, okay. are, these little cute little guys. They are cute. These are little, just a, sort of little lamb shanks are center cut. And I so noticed the bone good. is in, and people, uh, do you believe the bone imparts flavor to the oh, meat? Oh, absolutely. 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 So that's important. So what I'm going to do here, I'm just going to make a little bit, because I, I don't really need a whole lot. So is this is flour? Just, just flour. Just plain flour. A little, a little salt. Yep. Pepper. Mm -hmm. And so that's just, just your basic little, little seasoned salt. Mm -hmm. So you just want to give it a little coating. Just yeah. And then we're gonna throw it here. It'll help. It'll help it brown on the outside. So you want to brown it before it does that slow brown. Right. Right. It's just yeah. It's gonna it's gonna contribute some color and some flavor. You don't want to use your expensive olive no. oil at a time like this. So canola oil or corn oil or whatever. Okay. Whatever you like. But no flavor. I don't. I you know I, I tend to use here we use use corn oil. Um, it, it does have a, I mean, it does have a little bit of a flavor, but it's but pretty, pretty neutral well. compared to all of them. Sure. Okay. So, we're gonna do so I notice you heat the pan first, and then add. We're looking for it to shine, for it to smile at us. It's smiling. Yeah, you can see the smiling little, oil. That's see that the goal. Little, the little, those little ripples in there. I do. Okay. okay. Get hot. In the meantime. Right. These gonna, guys are gonna have a little coat. Just gonna on. have a little coat. This is really, you know, this is not like we're trying to, not trying to fry chicken. No. no. We're just trying to get a little coat. And that on does that also, too. so it helps the caramelization of browning, and then it also helps to thicken up whatever is going to go in just a little bit. As that, okay. as that, as that, and as that stock cooks down, it'll, uh, it's gonna be at a natural thicker that we didn't actually have to add to it. We didn't have to add a roux. Or... Really important to get your pan warm to get the result. Lamb shanks are browning yeah, beautifully. Brown. What, what next? 
why not? Let's see. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit more color than that. So this is what they should look like, really nice and okay, really and nice the goal and brown. Is not to cook them completely through. We're not even, no, we're, we're not, not even trying. We're not trying to do that. Okay. We're just trying to put that brown caramelization on oh, the outside. Beautiful. Of it. That's what makes such a good sauce and a good gravy. Okay. So those are almost done. Okay. So next, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check our root vegetables here. Like I said earlier, then if you can stick up. Kind of stick a fork in it that goes through fairly easy. Then those are done. That was still kind of hard. That's our root vega. So we're gonna let that go just a little bit longer. Is it my imagination or is the yellow from the carrot imparting some color onto the right. root vega? Oh it is, it'll okay. It'll look really nice though. Okay. okay. Well it certainly smells good. Okay, what are we okay. doing next? So next we're gonna take take our lamb shanks out. Okay. So, Again, just wanted to get some color. Right. We don't, I don't want to burn the flour in the bottom, so we don't really want to cook That's an unpleasant flavor, isn't it? Really yes, it is. To. What we're going to do, mm -hmm. we, want, we want all that goodness in here. Right, because all of that fire. is flavor. And remember to do that. Nobody needs to get burned while they're cooking. Not, not so that's the red wine, and you took it off the burner when you added the alcohol. Flare up. So the dry red wine that we also use to marinate the lamb chops is in there. So we're sharing flavor here. We're going to add sort of add vegetables here. We've got some here are sun dried tomatoes. Mm, good. You can use any kind of tomato product, tomato paste, diced tomatoes, whatever you have in your cabinet. But the sun dry is more intense flavor. Really more intense flavor. Okay, back to some more carrots here. And add some onion. All right, yellow onions or what? Yellow or white, whichever you, whichever you like. Okay, I saw celery going in there. Celery. Whole. I'm just going to do whole, I mean, because I've already got garlic in my marinade. Right. Um, you know, I, I, this is kind of a softer flavor where you just don't chop it up into mince, mm -hmm. you know, it'll be pieces. This is just going to be kind of a subtle, okay. subtle flavor. Okay, so we'll peel close the garlic. Now, what we'll do... Now, this is essentially we're creating the sauce for the also buco. Yeah. This, yeah. this is the braising. Braising. Okay. And braising means low and slow. Low and slow. It's something that usually you sear, you sear the meat, you put it in a pan with a little bit of liquid, you cover it, and you put it in a, in a moderate, you know, okay. 250, 275, 3 hours. Okay. And you let it cook for, you know, three or four hours usually. So yeah. let's fill this fork tender. So I can, so I can actually Falling put this fork in here and, off I, the bone. and I twist it and it doesn't have any resistance at all. That's what we're looking for. We're going to have some chicken stock. And if you don't have homemade, there's plenty of really good chicken stock product off the shelf. I'm okay. just going to kind of bring this all so kind of together a little bit. The aroma, of course, is heavy. Now, see, I'm not trying. I don't really need to cook the vegetables done now because right. they're going to be cooked. They're be cooking with uh, with the shanks for about you know three to four hours. Okay, so just get it mixed on the stove top, and here we go. We're going to put them right in here. That's beginning to look like the beginning of Osso which is traditionally done with veal, and we're doing it with lamb yeah. shanks. Okay. All right, now we're going to cover this. Well, make sure and I kind of make sure it's tight because I don't want because I want the I don't want that uh, braising liquid to evaporate. Okay, so it's steaming and cooking and everything at once. And so then we're going to cook this at 275. Okay. Start, in about two and a half hours, I start checking it. It's, it's, it's really getting syrupy. It's getting warm. I don't want it to I don't want it to to burn. So what I'm going to do is and I've got other things to do here still. Mm -hmm. Add a little bit more water to it. Right, and that, we're just going to let that cook down again. The piece that I'm loving here is combining the fruit with onion to get this, as you call it, demi-glaze. And I, I'm going to do that. I've done so many of your wonderful recipes and there's another. Okay, now how are these guys okay, doing? These guys are looking really good. These guys are okay, nice and pork tender. Pork tender. Okay. And it's rustic, but you know what? You know you're eating a vegetable. And it's, and it's, you know, it adds a little bit of different colors. Oh, that is wonderful. So the sweetness let... of the carrots is a perfect combination for this. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're just going to let it steam itself. Dry. So yeah. what, what you don't want to do is when it's done to let them set in the water. Even Let's when you're doing mashed remember, potatoes. Let's remember that. You don't want to let them. Let, if you, when the potatoes are done, don't let them set in the water because they, they just tend to absorb 
the water that you're sitting And you're sitting losing in. some of the flavor. You, have you ever taste mashed potatoes that didn't exactly taste like potatoes? They, they taste like water. water, too much, you know, overcooked. Overcooked is like one of the worst things you can do for mashed potatoes, too. You don't get that fluffy result. You get the steamed potato. Now, if, you have, if you're doing a large, if you're doing a large quantity, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can put it in in your uh, tabletop, table, well, tabletop mixer or something. Okay. You know, do it that way. Or the old fashioned. You can do the old fashioned way, which is like pushing the bag, kind of like just doing it for a small amount. No. This reminds me of my grandmother. May she rest in peace. But she did it that way, and boy, her potatoes always taste the best. We've been mashing the root vegetables, and now what are we going to do? It's really treating it like mashed potatoes, yes? Yes, absolutely. It's just exact, vegetables. It's even how better I for you. Okay. I'm just going to put a little bit of kosher salt. salt and pepper. Okay. And we're going to put a little bit of butter. Unsalted, I assume. I use, I use unsalted. You know, this is how I do my mashed potatoes with a masher instead of any cake chip. Okay, and we're going to add a little bit of hot cream to this. Okay. And we I think it's important that you don't take cream out of the refrigerator besides cold cream. Oh, it's because you want to try to keep it warm. Yeah, that doesn't work either. No, no, it doesn't. No, we won't do that. Okay, then we get to a point. Kind of yeah. with it. Then I get my spat. Like, now I can start doing this a little better. Mm. Now, what we'll do with this, mm -hmm. we'll taste and we'll taste and adjust the seasoning. Of course. It needs a little bit more salt and pepper. Okay. And uh, maybe some more butter. but. And again, sure. those things end up being to taste too, especially right. if you're working with someone who has some sodium restrictions. But if not, get it to where you want it. Okay. And then that's what we've got. We've got our mash. We have the last side dish to do, and you selected green beans. And what did you do to prepare them to this point? Okay, we, we blanched them. And okay. in, in blanching, you cook them in boiling water. And then you plunge them into an ice bath. Yes. You check them to make sure they're crisp tender before you do that. Yes. And then they sit in the ice bath for about as long as they were sitting in the boiling water. Meaning not a long time. Meaning a lot. And then once that's done, they take them out of the ice bath so they're just not sitting there leaching out all their flavor. All their flavor. And these are perfectly done as evidenced by the perfect green. And the texture is fabulous. And that's what we're going to do is we're just going to give them a quick saute because they're cooked. They're cooked. And we want them. We want it kind of al dente. We don't want them, I don't want them mushy, but I like the color. You know, we want to preserve some of the integrity of the vegetable. And so many of your vegetables, like broccoli, the same thing. You want that bright green, tender crisp. Okay, now we've got butter, and what kind of butter do we have here? Unsalted butter. Unsalted because you want to control. I want to add as much salt as I want. Not as much salt as butter. You never know, it's just, you never know if it's the same between brand and brand. brand. Okay. Okay. Not, don't want to brown it, don't want to brown the butter. So what we're doing here is just a really light uh, kosher salt, fresh cracked pepper, a little bit of butter, simple as perfect. And really the time that it takes to blanch is minutes. Just minutes. You know, it, but, now that's gorgeous. And of course, you know, depending on the ripeness of the, the vegetables, you yeah. can But we do. We just don't get any excited about our meal before it ever goes in our mouth just by what we see on the plate, let alone smell. Okay, chef, so it's time to plate. How do you suggest we do this? Okay. This is the way that I, I like to do this. Okay. Is that I kind of like to make a little quenelle out of the... Uh, out of your quenelle. Uh, football oh, shape. Oh, okay. Okay, so instead of just doing like a... Oh, how pretty. Instead of doing like a, you know, like a scoop like the cafeteria lady would We're do, not going to do We're that. not going to do that. No, we're not. So we just kind of... How pretty is that? That's a just, great technique. And then we're just going to... So it's going to be like a little football it's shape. It's a little football shape. Okay. That is a good football shape. Okay, and then, then we're next. we're going to line up several of our green beans here. We're all ready to go. They're ready for just their little... Lay those across the top there we here. go. Okay. okay. 
then we, we got great color going here. Great, great, great. You know, I've seen this done. I need to remember to do it. You know, we hear saran wrap is dangerous to put in the oven, but under a certain temperature, it's perfectly fine. Well, and it's like when you have oil over the top of it, it doesn't seem to really affect it. Okay, but look what we have. Oh, my, my, my. But see, now if we take, okay. our, we take our lamb shank here, and we take our, put our fork in it, then we kind of twist it. Uh -huh. See, it just kind of, that's what that. that's what you're wanting right there. You just want it to fall apart, just like uh, that. That's perfect. This is low, slow cooking, and it does, delivers every time. Okay, so we're and gonna the take, oh, yum. So we're going to take one okay. of our shanks here. Please remember, the recipe for this is on the website at inthekitchenwithbonnie.com. Okay. okay. We're going to take one of our our lamb chops. Now, these have been grilled, and just to remind our viewers that should you not want to fire up your grill, you can get one of those grill pans on your cooktop and get... You can do that, or if you don't even want to go that far, you can you can just saute them, kind of dry the marinade off of both sides, get, yes. your, get your pan hot, and just kind of do a quick pan sear on both yes. sides, and so that at least you'll get the caramelization, you know, on the outside of the lamb that really... Tell you, those old-fashioned yeah. cast iron skillets are good for that. All right, now... One of the stars of the show. Okay, now we went back and we got we added our. Added a little bit of water. Added a little bit of water yeah. because it was just kind of. I didn't want it to dry. But out. yours may or may not need the water. Right. It just depends. We're paying attention, right? And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a little bit of this. And I'm gonna a little bit of this little syrup that we've made. You're gonna see. That's gonna just kind of kind of leach out the bottom. It is. Well, it's just gonna be just gonna pull out. Which is fine. Yes. I know. You can kind of clean it up a little bit if you want to, or you okay. can go for the you can go for the rustic look. Okay. Now I know you want a little bit more green yeah, okay, on here. Okay. So we got a little little microgreens. We got some pea shoots. Huge. Some okay. little uh, some little uh, baby cilantro. Put Maybe that. a little tiny like bouquet. Just a, just a little, just a little garnish right here on top. And you can just add, parsley at home if you don't have microgreens. Do right. You can use uh, some of the stores where you have like daikon radish sprouts and turnip sprouts and bean sprouts. Oh, chef! And then, Thank you for inviting me into your kitchen again. Hello, I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have just been in the kitchen at Roselle Court preparing a signature dish with their executive chef, Dwight Hawkins. We made lamb two ways. One was grilled chop, the other was a slow roasted braised lamb shank. We've got sun-dried cherries on there, we've got roasted root vegetables, and now we've got to pair this very exciting and complex dish with some wine. What to drink? We are going to ask Stephen Blackman. Stephen, thank you for being willing to help us. He is the general manager of food and beverage here at the Nelson Museum. Okay, what have you selected, Stephen? Well, here at the museum, um, we like to have an international flair. So I have chosen two French wines for today. Okay. Um, they both pair well with the lamb. Mm -hmm. I have chosen the Chateau Pesque Testarossa. Okay, now this is a red. This is the red. And what is the flavor profile of this red? Um, we have licorice, we have black raspberries, cherries. Cherry's gonna go well with the demi-glace, yes? Absolutely, yes. that's one of the reasons we picked it. Yes. And a of pepper on the end. Okay, so it's gonna talk to us after it goes Absolutely. down a little bit. Okay, so that's the red selection. Now for those of us who can't or don't choose to drink red wine, what is this? Well, we've chosen a French Chardonnay. Mm -hmm. um, this French Chardonnay is unoaked. Ah. It's very crisp, very light, mm -hmm. it's dry, mm -hmm. has a hint of lemon and cinnamon. Okay, and that too would go beautifully with this dish. Now these are from boutique wineries in France? Yeah, they are from the Eric Solomon collection. They are boutique wines. Um, here at the Nelson, we do try to get wines that not just everybody can get, and it adds a little flair to the uh, atmosphere that we have here. Okay, so we primarily can just get this here at the Nelson Museum. Absolutely, yeah. Well, I want to thank you for your selection. I should tell you the true test is going to be when we have Julian, the CEO of the Nelson Museum, come and taste the food and sip the wine. Let's see what he says. All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm Bonnie Rabikoff, and we have been in the kitchen at Roselle Court of the Nelson Museum with their executive chef preparing lamb two ways. 
we have the dish paired by their general manager, and now we have the celebrity taster, their CEO here at the Nelson, Julian Zuga Sagoita. Fantastic, oh, no, yes, yes, perfect. I know your schedule is frenetic. Thank you for taking time out to perform this well, task. Well, to enjoy this, to I would enjoy this. Time. Yes. Okay, chef, please describe what do we have. Well, today we did lamb two ways because okay. it's one of my favorite things to work with, and it's just a really fall kind of a menu. We did a, a lamb chop that was kind of marinated in rosemary and garlic, and also did a braised lamb shank. Um, so we did a root vegetable mash, which has uh, parsnip, sweet potato, uh, and rutabagas in it, and then a sweet cherry demi glaze. So over, over the top of the whole thing, so the teeth French beans on the side. Okay, so we will be rewarded at least while we this no, no, no. meal. There's something for everyone here. All right, and Stephen, what have you paired for us? Well, I've paired a couple of nice French okay. wines. Mm -hmm. um, the red is a Chateau Pesque Tesserosa, mm -hmm. and the white is an unoaked Chardonnay, and it's called Nobello. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you for all your hard work, and now we're going to taste. Thank you. Okay. Enjoy. Thank you. Julian, you. Well. First, ah, cheers. Cheers, and to life, and to your life. I don't you so? did that well. It's very hard. Mm. It perfect. is hearty, so you and can see why perfect. we chose it with the lamb. Yeah, right. With the lamb, it's going to go perfect. All right, now we're do, doing the lamb. And what I think is so enjoyable is that Chef chose to do the lamb two ways. Mm -hmm. Very powerful, mm, very tasty. A bit sweet, which is interesting, no? Okay. The cherry demi glaze mm -hmm. is is in there. I want to taste the root mash. That's some of the finest lamb. You see, mm. he's been time. Is it? Oh. Mm -hmm. It's delicious. It's delicious. And the shank is also really so tender. Yeah, now I have, to, I have to do the shank. You know, lamb is challenging to make in mm. that you can overcook it real easily. You can under... Oh, my. That just fell off the bone. Yeah, it, it just, it just, it just fell melts. off mm -hmm. the bone. So the shank was roasted. Mm -hmm. The chop was grilled. You got the smoky and the sweet and the tangy. You have a wonderful chef here. Yeah. I suppose you already know that part. We definitely, we have we to We definitely do. Now I know why the red was chosen. Mm -hmm. Should we taste the white or see? Let's see. And then you can tell us which one you like best. Again. Salud. Salud. Ching ching. Mm -hmm. Very fresh and young. And I understand why he chose not to have the oak. He didn't want the smoky. He just wanted this mm -hmm. to stand up to it. Okay. okay, speaking of choosing. Yes. Now, I know we oh, chose. For this particular. You want the, the red. red. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm going to double check and see if this I do too. Yeah, no, I think it just smooths. But there are some people who don't do red wine mm -hmm. for health or preference. Yes, exactly. And so we have options for... Well, this is perfect pairing also. It's, it's really, really fresh. It's mm -hmm. really, really fresh. So I know we chose you to be our CEO, mm -hmm. but you also chose to come to Kansas City and come to the Nelson. Tell me why. Well, I just felt that this city... Well, first of all... Yes. You see this museum, you see this collection, and, and, and world class, world class, world class. And it has uh, been cared uh, by a successor of directors, of board members, of staff in a way that is a jewel. So you want to be part of something that is so well cared for, and at the same time that has so much potential. But also, it's a timing. <laughs> Coming to this city at a time in which the Performing Arts Center was being finished. That, that helped lure you, didn't it? Totally, you totally. I love all the arts and, and seeing that amazing, amazing uh, construction going on, that it was happening, that it was real, knowing that 
this is a community that is investing in the arts, it's investing also like a few weeks ago in the announcement by Henry Block that he's supporting the, the School of Entrepreneurship. You, you see that it's a city that is committed to great things. And so I want just to be part of a to great city where everybody is switching in when I think we can demonstrate that there is going to be this transformation of Kansas City through the arts, through the creativity industry, through the entrepreneurship. And, and I think whether it's a Kaufman Foundation, the performing arts, with UMKC, the conservatory, the symphony, the rep, all of this talent is just amazing. And it is a city also one of the largest employers of talent, where the talent is home. Yeah. So being in a city that engages whether it's people who write those parts or who design. This is a city that has much more creative talent than I ever anticipated to reach, this let alone the architects. I mean, we had such a great architecture Future. community. Yes. And so, yeah, when I started seeing all that, it's like, of course, and it is a hidden treasure in the world, okay. Kansas City. But little by little, we have to raise the volume. We have to raise the volume, and you know, great place to raise your children, all the Midwest yes. values and totally. standards. And okay, so you were drawn by what we were doing, what we were about mm -hmm. to do. Mm -hmm. What is your vision? So you you, you come to this treasure as you yeah. described it. What is your vision for what you would like the museum to be in five to 10 years? Well, my, my the challenge that we have and, and, and what I've been trying to articulate with, with our friends is what would it look or what would it take so that the museum and the, the space in which we are is a space that is much more inviting, a place where you just want to hang out, you know? Right. Some people, when you say art, it seems intimidating, it seems, it seems a bit like maybe, maybe I just don't want to do it. But it is not only about art, it's about you. And I think people will discover themselves in the space. We want to be is the museum from everybody. A museum that is open to everybody's ability or desire either to explore or hang out, want to have just a meal in a nice, beautiful cat like Roselle Court, or on the country bring their kids to do some of our classes or some of our workshops, get dirty with playing with uh, sculpture. You know, so there's so many levels in which the Nelson can be participant and active in people's lives. Uh, I will talk to people about, mm -hmm. oh, we, we did a show here, it's so stunning, and they said, oh, I've just got to get to the Nelson, but you know, I don't have the time to see the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And what, one of the things I'm saying is, see what exhibit, go to what area. You don't have to do it all at one time. It is accessible, it's easy to make happen. Bonnie, you know, I just had a, a a good analogy to share with you. Okay. And it just came because we're, we're eating a great dish well, and it's all about food. Okay. It's exactly what you say. Imagine you would go to a restaurant and you would have one of each of the whole menu. <laughs> you would die, you know? So don't come to a museum thinking you have to see it all, especially when it's big and universal and encyclopedic like ours. See a couple of galleries and then have a nice time at Brazil or just in the sculpture garden. Walk Coffee around. or wine or scone. Exactly. You know what my favorite painting is. Which one is it? Carvaggio's. Oh. John the Baptist. No, he, he is. probably it, it's, not it's new. He's just, it's gorgeous. And I think if you start your children young, and they have yes. this wonderful parent child class that my son and I used to go Oh, really? To. We uh -huh. did. Uh -huh. We had so much fun. And we did a, mm -hmm. a family reunion here. You know, we wanted to show off Kansas City to the mm -hmm. Rabicops and other parts of the country. And we just went to one exhibit after we had dinner here, and it was perfect. It's very inviting. It's it is. very accessible in every way. Well, I want to thank you for taking time out of your frenetic schedule, but also for the devotion that I can feel you're bringing here and what that means for the future of the Nelson here in Kansas City. Hmm. We no. appreciate that you fell in love with us and decided to stay. Well, you know, and I, I love that you have your show here. And you know, it's... Kansas City. It is Kansas City, but it's also one of the things that we value enormously, a good wine, a good meal. It's all of appreciation about life. And, and, and you know, when we have the art that we have, it's we have the best talent oh, showcasing heaven. their moments in glory. So 
this space, what allows you is just to slow down from your the craziness outside in the world or rushing the car. This, your senses are just open. And so it's open for a good meal, a glass, great glass of wine, or enjoying the art that is around us. And so what a better way to just enjoy life and to be in a museum that is free for all. I'm Bonnie Rabakoff, and we are back in the cellar with Marquis Selections and their managing director, Chris Cribb. Thank you for inviting us back into your cellar. Sure, Bonnie. Great to be here. It is great to be here. We began earlier a discussion about pairing wines with cheese, and we are in the holiday season. We're going to be doing a lot of entertaining. Let's make this really exciting. What do Great. you suggest? Sure. You know, when we were talking about what we can do to kind of help educate people for the holiday right. season, I said, you know, the, the new high bee that they built up in Liberty has a great Amazing. international cheese section. Yep. And um, everybody knows that wine and cheese are great friends. They do. They're good friends. But it's kind of an intimidating thing. So I wanted to give people a few go-to areas that they can, uh, can try. A couple of cheeses that I think are some of my favorites. Mm -hmm. and, um, Would one and of them be a brie? It is a brie. Oh, you know, that's a lot of people's favorites. Yeah, well, You're not going to go wrong if you have a brie as yeah. one of your cheeses. True, true. Okay. And, and right. I have a Chardonnay, which a lot of people like. And Chardonnay. everybody loves Chardonnay, so yeah. let's talk about why you put these together. Sure. Well, the first, uh, the first cheese here, let's just show this beautiful cheese off. This oh. is the uh, French. Mm -hmm. uh, St. Andre's Triple Cream Brie. I, I can't control myself. I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. You can get in okay, there. It's, um, uh, you know, when we look at the brie's that they have, there's all oh kinds of that go from the, the softest to more with a little more rind. This one, um, it's I like just love. Hey, it. yeah, it's so good. The, the richness with the um, Oh. That very soft flavor. This one's been out just enough time so that Please it's... remember to take your cheeses out a little before yes. serving so that the flavors just bloom that way. Absolutely. So, you know, we we wanted to do this with, we did this with the Chardonnay. Okay. So. Mm. The... And, and this, you know, this is not a, a, an unusual pairing, so it's very accessible to it your is. guests. Very accessible to the guests. You know, this Chardonnay is from Australia, so it's got a little bit of the um, oak aging to it. And buttery. And buttery. Mm. And it's got a little bit of that um, kind of tropical fruit flavors, I think. So I, now I have to take another piece of the cheese. You know, I've seen people do some really exciting things with brie. I've seen them put it in the oven for just like a few minutes mm. and top it with honey or preserve and then maybe throw some toasted pistachios on top of that and it's going to work beautifully with the Chardonnay because it holds up to richness and sweet at the same time. It does. The reason that I think that this worked is because of the simplicity of the cheese. Mm -hmm. It didn't have those extra tarragon, bright, big flavors mm -hmm. um, where one of the things that we looked at was one that had a, a pepper rind around the outside. And I love black no, Right, and there's and there's nothing wrong. I just saw a cheese that had been dipped into ground espresso yeah. beans, but this provides the versatility to do whatever. Right. You know, and that, that pepper cheese, mm -hmm. as we went through, we tasted other wines, it actually almost went better with a red wine because it had that. enough spice to it that you wanted to do something different. Mm -hmm. so, so when you're thinking about that, just... Just like when you're thinking about pairing food and wine, yes, the sauce is really important. You know, it's not just what do we do with chicken, but what are the ingredients with the chicken that are going to determine the right. wine. And an pair. orange chicken is a lot different from uh, a tarragon yeah. chicken yep. than from a mm -hmm. beer can chicken. Beer can chicken. <laughs> okay. But um, well, that's that is just heaven. And and again, uh, brie is such a crowd pleaser, and going with something versatile like this. And with this particular Chardonnay, sure. I don't know if you've ever had the good fortune of having a grilled cheese sandwich with brie in it, but it's just it's, I, I have. Just, it's it, just it, amazing. It's one of yes, my you favorites. have actually. Yeah, yep. So. It's amazing. All right. So what what next okay. for our cheese board? So we um, we are going to a little bit stronger cheeses, okay. and we we'll have get brave. gone yeah, mm -hmm. to a place that 
not probably many people in the U.S. have been to before. This is in Australia. Okay, we don't usually think of this in... No. No. Um, well, this is a small island off the south coast of Australia called King Island. Mm -hmm. And this is called the Roaring Forty Blue Cheese. Okay. So it... Um, the... We know about the Roaring Twenties now. Yeah. The Forties apparently roared in Australia. Okay. You know, they, okay. We're in a different time period. Okay. And that was right sure. before the uh, the war down there. Right. They, um, they had a really booming economy down there. And this... Uh, this place became a, a dairy uh, on this small island, okay. and now it's known for making that honey and a little bit of wine. Honey, well, but, but you know how many people mix honey with, you know, a toasted nut when they're doing cheese. Okay, so this is a blue, would you call this yes, a blue this cheese? Yes, blue cheese. This okay. is a strong vein blue cheese. All um, right, not for everybody, but... Yeah, and this is one of the reasons why we paired this one up, um, and you can kind of see those deep that he yeah. blue cheese in there mm -hmm. uh, is because the wine that we've got here is the uh, Silver Wings Vincenzo, mm. which is our most collectible Australia. wine from Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a blend of Shiraz and Mouvedre, mm -hmm. and it's it's an intense wine. And so that would need intense. It's an intense mm -hmm. cheese to go with it. So this is... Mm. To your health. Mm -hmm. So this has got that, that old vine... Mouvedre is known for being kind of rich, a little bit leathery, longer palate. Mm -hmm. um, it's very, very smooth. It is smooth for being such a full-bodied wine. It's smooth. Now, this cheese, you know, it, I, I've also seen these cheeses sliced and put on salads. Absolutely. And so you don't normally think of red wine with salad, but that salad, to me, would have this wine next to it. Well, and this is kind of an homage as well to one of the best classical food wine pairings, mm -hmm. which is, um, we're going to be tasting a Stilton blue cheese. Mm -hmm. okay. It's a blue cheese Comparison. and a mm -hmm. port wine. Port wines uh, from Portugal have been a classical pairing with these type of cheeses for a long time. Mm -hmm. We went a little non-classical, so the, this is a wine that you can have with your steak, yes. and then after you've had that glass with your steak, and you're going, all right, what am I going to have for a little nightcap mm -hmm. at the end, mm -hmm. pull out a nice deep blue vein cheese, mm -hmm. and I thought both of the comparisons would give you a little bit of different ah, flavors. So. Okay, so we're, we're going to compare both, and you know many people now are serving a cheese course sure. as, as part of the dinner, and to have this variety of cheeses with a few wines is almost better than dessert, or oh, sometimes yeah. it's in the place of dessert. All right, now we're going to taste. Tell us the difference again. Sure, this is the Royal Blue Stilton. So this okay. is a English cheese. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see, you know, when you look at the, the color here, there's not quite as much of a vein in this cheese. No. A little bit more of a creamy Significantly flavor. different in flavor, yeah. yet you're saying both work with this red cheese? Work. I mean, yeah. red wine? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So more creamy, well, more right. butter. Yeah, it it goes. You are right. A um, this is like the intense I cow. This is like think, because these are okay. That that's true. But and this wine is is working really well with both of them. Yeah, well, it's, I all mean, right. If you wanted to try something to go, all right, what, what doesn't work? Try this Chardonnay with the, with the yeah, blue That cheese. wouldn't work. Like, no, no, no. Um, why did I do that? Okay, now let's talk about collecting. Sure. You know, people are intimidated by collecting art and also by collecting wine. And they're, it's a wonderful thing to do. It's yeah. a wonderful thing to share with people. How do you even begin to approach the thinking Wine. Well, I think that there's a couple tips that I've been given that I, I really love to pass along. Uh, one, I believe, is that when you go to and you have a memory of something, uh, mm -hmm. wine is a great thing to be able to bring that memory back because you're also doing what you did then with mm -hmm. senses. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so special occasions. Special occasions, great thing for wine. Um, if you're visiting and traveling places, it's a way to bring back that place you were traveling mm -hmm. from. Um, there's a lot of places in the world where you can travel and they'll ship stuff back to you, so it's they not will. here. Not a trouble. Not a big trouble. Nope. Um, and what I like to do in a lot of situations is to buy three bottles. Okay. I call it the rule of three. The rule of three. And the, okay. the idea being that uh, I'm going to get it home, and like the greedy kid that uh, <laughs> just got his whole bag of candy yep. from Halloween. Yep. Can't I wait. get home and I, I want those bottles. 
Oh. So know that I'm going to probably open one of those bottles by the next year. Yeah, you got so, it. You know, so, all right, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I bought it. Mm -hmm. I bought three so that I could open one of them then. And then I know that I can probably open one two years, three years, four years, up to five years. And, and you could also plan, you know, there's a special occasion or I've got an important anniversary or birthday coming sure, up. Sure, sure. So you're not deprived by having to hold all of it. So if you have three, you can make that happen. Yeah, you can. And the, the other thing that I find is I look at white wine and red wine a little differently because their aging qualities are different. Right. Um, most white wine is not built to age as long. Right. Uh, there are some Chardonnays, French Chardonnays, California Chardonnays in some places, some uh, German Riesens and things that are meant to age a longer time, but really For the most part, five to ten years is that's, really kind that's, of you're pushing. The, the, okay. the tops pushing it on wines. Um, most of the reds probably would go a little bit further than that. And it's it's a price point continuum. So okay. if you're going to be spending ten dollars on a bottle, it's not meant to be aged. If you're going to be spending okay. twenty five dollars on a bottle, probably is meant to be aged a little bit. And what you'll see that goes downhill like that is wines that aren't taken care of. Okay. And we and we talked about that storing them down so the cork stays moist. Yep. Light and heat are its enemy, Absolutely. and so we won't do anything to be neglectful or abusive to our wines yeah. and really your basement laying on its side or just wherever you put off to one side well, if you don't have a wine you refrigeration have, unit you don't have a cellar you don't have the refrigeration the basement is a, is a nice area especially in the midwest some places in the country in the world don't have that luxury yeah. um you know a, a closet that's away from Dark. stuff and dark is always a good spot. Um, try to remember vibration too. You don't oh. want to be right next to a door that's always slamming shut because you're going to be shaking the bottles. Uh, I just that's, want something. That's we don't want to one. do that. So, so we want it in a place in the house that doesn't have a lot of movement, kids running around, jumping up and down. And Okay, basically we're just going to take really good care of this yeah, wine. Yeah. And you've done that also with your selection process. Your portfolio has received recognition from Wine Spectator. How did you do that? Well, yeah, Wine Spectator, um, Wine Enthusiast, Robert Parker Magazine have all looked at our portfolio as being a great value for the money. Mm -hmm. You know, we have we don't have 100 point wines on their 100 point scale, mm -hmm. but we do have a lot of wines that are above 85 to 92 points. Which Very is that, respectful you know, ratings, especially the prices that you don't buy. Right. You know, this is a $15 Chardonnay. This is a uh, $30 um, Shiraz Mouvedre blend. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Wine Spectator said 92 points and 89 points mm -hmm. on both of them. So mm -hmm. it's, I think the, the idea of what they looked at in our portfolio, and they do overall, is the value for the money, the unique regions that we're bringing them mm -hmm. from, and uh, the fact that we're committed to uh, smaller batch uh, artisan winery. And that you really care about the organic, sustainable practices of your winemakers. Absolutely, because what you find is that uh, by being a shepherd, to work in the vineyard with no pesticides, no herbicides, mm -hmm. using the, um, the modern technology we have, to their, to their advantage, they're able to get really ripe fruit, uh, not change the flavor of the fruit, mm -hmm. bring it in very, very fresh, fruity, and uh, and then shepherd it from there through the winemaking process. Uh, just a, uh, a lovely way to be able to to do almost any type of agriculture. And I'm, I'm glad to see that the wine industry is really starting to embrace it like other industries have. And, and, and we're so fortunate that they are. Um, if you want to learn more about Marquee, just visit their website at www.marquee.com. You can call them at 1-888-MARQUEE. And join us again next week in the cellar when we talk about tailgate. Very serious time of year to do that. It is. We're in a good city to talk about tailgating. So. <laughs> in the meantime, to your health. Cheers. <laughs>